everyone, I'm Dr. David Ajibari and welcome to Your Health in Your Hands. Remember, at the Brain and Body Foundation, if you guys have been watching us for any period of time, you know that uh, our goal is to help kids, especially medically fragile kids, uh, with brain disorders, sickle cell disease, genetic conditions. And we've been doing this for about six, uh, going on six years now. And uh, we've seen hundreds and hundreds of children. But in this session, in this session, we want to talk about the th some of the things we've seen over th these six years of working with kids, uh, the errors that the parents are making. I mean, and it's not just about the parents, really. Sometimes it's just they didn't have access to medical intervention when they needed it. I have a very good friend who they did all the antenatal clinics. They attended, took up the medications as prescribed. They attended everything. They got, um, did everything their doctor told them to do. But when it was time for the delivery of their first child, a girl, hospitals were on strike. <laughs> and uh, they waited and waited. The, guy, the OBGYN wasn't around. The gynecologist, no, even the nurses weren't around. So they had to, you know, profit. They had to manage. And eventually the child came out with severe brain problems. And uh, this is a child that they're going to have to live with for the rest of their lives. And of course, they love that child, but this could have been avoided. That's just one example. There are other examples in which the parents were just careless. They, were, they took the drugs they shouldn't have taken, or they were taking a lot of alcohol or smoking, and that caused damage to the growing child. In other cases, they did what their doctors told them to do. And maybe it didn't cause as much damage, but when the kid came out, there were things that, let's say, they just didn't turn out the way they should. So today, I'm going to have on, on the show, Dr. Albert Menser. You're welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. David. I appreciate and it. And we've, we've had you on before. This episode, we're talking about the first thousand days from conception to about two or three. I guess that's two years, right? Correct. Except nine, but what, what is it now? Yeah, I think it's about a thousand days. Right? Yeah. So thank you for making it. All right. So let's start. Um, let's start with conception. We all know that you, you, the parents have to be relatively healthy to conceive a child. Obviously, they have to be healthy. Obviously, they have to, there are certain chemicals or certain nutrients that have to be at a certain level for there to be normal development, especially of the brain, which of course we are particularly interested in. But going further down the line, there are other, also other things that they need to have in place or the parents need to have in place. Can you just talk to, take us through that, that process? And I'm sure it's going to take longer than one episode, but let's, let's at least start. Well, what I'll do, I'll, I'll try not to make this too terribly complicated really for the, the entire audience. Um, you're correct. To me, life, is a miracle. If everyone knew how many little tiny pieces need to be in place consistently to have a child, you couldn't possibly imagine why we're even alive today. Hmm. Yeah. One thing goes wrong in the system and huge problems can happen, especially early in conception, but to make life very simple. So when we, we look at fertility, for example, well, people will talk about for a man, um, what kind of things, foodstuffs, maybe make you fertile or give you that energy, shall we say, genetic energy. And people say, well, go ahead and eat oysters, right? Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead and, and do this and this and this. Well, the simple point is that the ingredient in the oysters that provides virility for a man is zinc. Right. Zinc. Right. Now, here's the other side of the equation. If a woman doesn't have appropriately high levels of zinc, if she's carrying a male child at conception, mm -hmm. she may lose that child. Really? The male child development requires a lot of zinc in order to determine or to, in order to fulfill uh, spermatogenesis, so the development of sperm within that sac and the, the individuals who are low in zinc may lose that child. Hmm. So if a woman miscarries, in particular males, hmm. if she has a sequence of not carrying 
babies through to term, and in particular males, it could be something as simple as a lack of zinc. That is, that is amazing. And it's, it's actually quite true. Um, from the male side of the equation, it's one thing to, to produce the sperm, but when the sperm have done their job and there's conception, now it's within the realm of the female to be able to continue that process. Now that sounds very logical, but some of the pieces we did not know we're missing. We're all told about folic acid. So the mother takes folic acid before conception. She's taking folic acid once she conceives, mm -hmm. but no one ever talked about zinc. I'm hearing it for the first time. And so the key here is that you must have appropriate levels of zinc if you're carrying a male child, okay? To what now, term? Throughout the nine months? Or what, usually, when is the most crucial? Usually, yeah. usually within the first trimester is most crucial. First three months, okay. Within the first trimester, possibly even moving between first and second trimester. Got it. And, and um, what levels would those be, for instance? What would be ideal? An ideal level is what we would reference as 90, 90. okay, on testing. But see, the, nobody knows that because they don't test what we do, okay. For a female, I would suggest that at least 50 milligrams of zinc be on board pre-pregnancy while you're trying to conceive and then throughout the first trimester. So for okay. the, the, the- Now here's what's significant. Sorry, just, just to be sure, the mother-to-be and the pregnant, pregnant mother should be taking 50 milligrams a day. Is that what you're saying? Preconception, absolutely. And then realistically, I said 50 milligrams for the first trimester, but realistically, I would say anywhere between 30 milligrams and 50 milligrams. She should really be tested. That would be optimal. When yeah. the mother is tested, then we know exactly where she is. Now, we have to be very careful with nutrients because whatever the mother's taking, the baby gets. Right. Okay. And we don't want to create a problem in the developing child by taking high levels of zinc because that can actually create an anemia, okay? Now, if a child is anemic in utero, we haven't even talked about this, but if a child is anemic in utero, what does that mean? They're not getting oxygen, which is counterproductive to the whole idea of the developing child and pregnancy. So we have to be very, very cautious. So let's talk about pre-pregnancy. Pre-pregnancy, before conception, 50 milligrams of zinc is a good idea. As soon as someone knows that they are pregnant, however, that should stop and maybe go down to a very low dosage of zinc. I see. Maybe about 15 milligrams. Okay, I see. One, five milligrams. Okay. I see, I see. But thank even you for pointing that out, Doc, because I mean, like you and I have gone back and you warned me over and over again. So I'm going to say it out for everybody that you want me to be careful. But I'm always conscious of the fact that most of our viewers and many, if not most patients who are watching this will probably not have the ability to have those minute by minute tests and day to day t accurate testings. So I'm always looking for the lowest, safest possible amounts that, that you can give to a patient and they can say, okay, I'm doing the right thing, other than not doing anything at all, because we don't want that either. Correct. Yeah. Correct. That's why even during this conversation, I had to revise a few things because as we're moving through the different processes, the different stages, then there's greater accessibility and greater potential challenge, even for the baby, from nutrients. That's why one never takes nutrients, especially high dosage nutrients, on their own, on your own, without having physician guidance. Got it. Yes. We talk about folic acid uh, to prevent neural tube defects. Mm-hmm before pregnancy and in the first trimester. Now here's the thing, it's what we didn't know that became problematic. We began to say, well, you know, if folic acid is good to prevent neural tube defects in the first trimester, well, maybe continuing folic acid for the second trimester is a good idea. Well, then it became, well, maybe continuing it for the full pregnancy and then continuing it after pregnancy. And do you know what, Dr. David? The incidence of attention deficit disorder or ADHD, as well as the rates of autism, all began to rise. When you and I were growing up, we never heard of autism. 
That's we never right. heard of ADHD. Not even many. But we, we know these two conditions to be under methylated conditions. And folic acid, while in the one part of the cell, the cytoplasm, it's a great powerful methylating agent. But then it dives into the nucleus of the cell and becomes a demethylating agent. Wow. In our immortal ignorance as physicians, we made assumptions that indirectly have likely led to this increase in ADHD as mm -hmm. well as autism. We I have see. created under methylated infants because of the extreme use of the wrong nutrients for too long during pregnancy and beyond. Hmm. So this is why we talk about the power of nutrients. Nutrients are not benign. You and I were both taught in medical school that nutrients made no difference. We were both yeah. taught that it's nothing. You don't use it for treatment, it's just for food. That's why it's called a supplement. <laughs> Correct. These are primary ments, not supplements. Mm -hmm. This is how our systems work. This is like saying the, the fuel for your car is insignificant. You try driving on less than one-tenth of a gallon of gas for 30 miles and see what happens in your car. Right. right. So we have to reorient our thinking. But this is huge, Doc. This, right this now, is, it, because of this, absolutely. Yeah. It, so it, our recommendations at Mensa Medical is that after the first trimester, you stop the folic acid. Stop it. Absolutely. Just ensure that you have been in development at least three months. So oftentimes we'll say, listen, once you find out your pregnancy, you go four months. Okay. Then we know for sure that you are indeed pregnant. You've gone through the first trimester. Then you can stop the folic acid. That's our recommendation. Okay. Because we've seen way too much and we've made these connections. More than 20 years ago, we've been saying this. But now, if you look at multivitamins, there are a few companies who've gotten wind of this and they've stopped adding folic acid to the multivitamins. Or they're making them in stages now for the first trimester, then after the first trimester. And actually, that was our idea. Okay. Interesting. So we have to be very, very careful about some of these things. Okay. So I, I, I would be hallucinating. I mean, I, I could hallucinate that in many developing countries, our doctors don't know this. In many developed countries, our doctors don't know this. In fact, it may have been the developed countries that created the most harm because we made assumptions that are not scientifically sound based upon the evidence some 20, 30 years later. Hmm. All right, so uh, uh, you do have evidence. I know we've talked about this before, but uh, any OBGYN is going to say, well, that's a book. That doesn't make sense. It's a bunch of whatever. That's not how we're taught. If you were to tell them where to go, what, where, where should they go to? to Here's to, one. To, Let's to, talk to anyone who's skeptical about what we just said. Yeah. Was there ever any evidence that folic acid beyond the first trimester was necessary? No one, I guess no one has really checked, checked that. Oh. We all Common, Dr. David, at what point in time is the human brain vulnerable in development? Well, the first trimester, for sure. The first trimester. So what do you need to do to protect the brain up to the first trimester? Your folic acid. Amongst other things. But if the brain is only vulnerable up until the first trimester, then why would you need folic acid beyond the first trimester? Okay, but, do we know, but don't we know that? I would think the brain is vulnerable throughout. No, sir. De development, neural tube. Once the neural tube is formed, nothing is going to happen to it. Okay. Right? The whole point to folic acid was the development of neural tube and the prevention of neural tube challenges or deficits. Okay. There is no, none, there's no problem with regard to neural tube defects after the first trimester, okay? 
So yeah. you don't need to give folic acid to stop neural tube defects because the neural tube is already formed. It's done. That's okay. science. That's science. Okay, so yeah. it's like saying, well, if you produce your car, then going through the production process is necessary again and again and again and again, but your car is already made. What I said didn't even make any sense, okay? Just now with the car example. That's like saying you're trying to prevent neural tube defects. The brain is now fully developed, but you're still trying to prevent neural tube defects by taking more folic acid. No, the mm -hmm. brain is done. Interesting. Okay, we're gonna to have to take a short break here, but I want to say this, folks, you don't have to wait until you hear this. I mean, for, he's not asking you to add anything else. It's basically saying this, after your third or fourth month of pregnancy, you want to step back from the folic acid. It may, uh, as you've seen the argument, you've seen the reasoning, it is not going to harm your child if you take it, take it away. And there are other things too that you can add to, like he's mentioned. So please, you don't have to wait until you get the permission. You can take step back on your folic acid for the sake of your child. We'll take a break now and we'll be right back. Okay, so it's about the neural tube formation. Correct. However, the brain does continue to develop throughout pregnancy and it still needs right. support. But who says folic acid is that support? Exactly. Okay, so it's, it's not it's about not. folic acid again. It's, it's not, not about, about the folic acid. Got it. No. Okay. There are many other nutrient elements that are key at that particular point in time. Got it. Many other elements that are key. Okay. Let's, let's, let's talk about some of those other ones. Let's talk about that for one moment. Okay. So antioxidants. Right. Protecting the brain against oxidative stress. Very, very key. That's where your vitamin C comes into play. That's where your vitamin D comes into play. That's where your zinc comes into play. You know the antioxidants that are out and available. Nature provided them, the fruits, the mm -hmm. vegetables. Right. All these things contain antioxidants that when the mother eats them can be very protective to help the brain and development of the developing infant, embryo, fetus, okay? Right. Folic acid is not that. Okay. So we started by asking the question, someone says, well, that doesn't make any sense and so forth. And I said, have you actually thought about it? Go back to basic science, not you doctor, but in general, doctor, whoever you are, and ask yourself, you were taught folic acid was necessary for this. Mm -hmm. You were never taught anywhere that folic acid was necessary beyond this. That's correct. Okay. That's so correct. we then had to make an assumption since we were never taught that we then assumed it without any actual scientific evidence or data that it was necessary. All right. That makes, that makes sense. Now the question uh, the intelligent doctor would ask is, well, okay, so where's the data that shows that it is, Detrimental beyond ah, that. You're at too far. Wonderful. I'm glad we asked that question mm -hmm. because we came to find out what methylation truly is okay. and okay. what folic acid does as it strips you of methyl. So, what is a methyl molecule? A methyl molecule is that which activates and regulates enzymes, hormones, and neurotransmitters. Mm. You need a process of attachment of a methyl molecule to any one of those agents we just talked about, and then they get removed, but when they attach, they activate, they set things in motion. Mm. I'm going to give you one very simple example. Let's go back to pregnancy and gestation. When the sperm and the egg come together and they fuse and you get your zygote, okay? Before the first cellular division, there's a process that happens. Before the first cellular division, turning that one cell into two, mm -hmm. you add one methyl molecule to the system, one methyl molecule leaves, and another molecule gets re-added, okay? You add one, remove one, and add another. Before the first cellular division, that process happens 12 million times within a fraction of a second. 
12 wow. million times. That's 24 million methyl are needed to be added to that situation. Hmm. But you lose 12 million at the same time hmm. before the first cellular division. So if methyl molecules activate and inactivate, if they control systems of development within the cell, and now you have an agent that is inappropriately removing methyl molecules. What are you doing to the system? <laughs> You're offsetting it, offsetting the balance. Correct. Okay, that's point number one. So now let's move beyond this concept of the first second. Now we're past the first trimester, okay? Now, some people are naturally what we call low in methyl. They're undermethylated. Some people are naturally high in methyl. They're over methylated. Both are problems, okay? Now, usually there's a balance between 60% undermethylated individuals and 40% overmethylated individuals. But in the last 20 years, we've seen an extreme rise in undermethylated conditions, including schizophrenia. Mm. You used to be able to find X percentage undermethylated schizophrenia, X percentage overmethylated schizophrenia, but now it's in the other direction. It too is predominantly an undermethylated phenomenon now. It wasn't like that 20 years ago. Really? So we have the rise. If you graph this, this is what our doctors love to do create a graph. Look from pregnancy and infancy all the way through to adulthood. Look at all the conditions that people like us are aware of that involve methylation, autism, ADHD, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. And then look at what the chemistries are for these individuals. You'll see that they're all undermethylated predominantly now. Interesting. They rise all along the same slope, doctor. So now you have to ask the question, what are the potential causes of this? What can affect methyl? And it's like an elephant in the room. It's folic acid. Now, after having said all that, Johns Hopkins University did a study that showed that individuals who are autistic, Johns Hopkins in the United States, Johns Hopkins did a study that concluded by saying that high levels or prolonged use of folic acid may contribute to autism. No way. Really? Look it up. We need I, I, that was That was almost 10 years after we said this publicly. Really? So why, why hasn't this affected the, the management of pregnant women then? Why well, hasn't that, You know, today's research, how long does it take to get into medical school? Yeah, you, know, but you know anywhere you know anywhere from five decades <laughs> to, to a century. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vitamin C was yeah. like a century, wasn't it? Pardon? Vitamin C. Wasn't that like a century? Yes. Yeah. And yeah. people were still skeptical. They still are, yes, yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, anything in medicine, when you have the discovery, it takes a long time before it gets into schools. And then it takes even longer in order to get to, um, to this thing, to uh, practice, right? So right. even with the age of the internet, now we have another explosion of information and people still aren't certain what is true and what is not true. Right. Okay? Because right. of all this new data that's coming out, okay? But to me, this is very simple. What did you do differently during gestation as a practitioner before all of this happened. And what are you doing now? Folic acid. We could go on forever. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. So much to do, so much to learn, so much to share. A little time. So Dr. Mensa, thank you so much. Folks, you've been listening to the master at work, Dr. Mensa of Mensa. Oh. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> We definitely will be hearing from, from him uh, many more times in the future. So thank you, sir, so much. Dr. David, always a pleasure. Thank you. May you and your patients and everyone be well. Thank you. Thank you. So, folks, there you have it. Please stay healthy, stay strong. Your health is in your hands, so you got to take control of it. So 
God bless. Remember, these videos are archived on the website, brainandbodyfoundation.org, free for you to access. And if you have to get a hold of us, you know how to do that. If you need help for your kids with brain disorders, sickle cell disease, again, reach out to us. We, we ship to all over the country, all 36 states. You just have to pay for shipping, but the supplements and the medications are free. So don't uh, make sure you take uh, avail, that, avail yourself of that. So God bless, stay strong, and we will see you soon.